It is the holy grail of neuroscience to understand how the information is being represented inside the brain, encoded in patterns of activity of nerve cells. On this quest, we make use of tools offered by biology, physics, chemistry, computer science, and of course, math. Today, I'm super excited to tell you about the concept that I think is just unbelievably beautiful. We'll discuss neural manifolds and how abstract mathematics of high dimensional spaces can be used to unravel the secrets behind the neural circuits. The video is structured in the following way. First, we'll refresh some very basic neuroscience concepts and see how we can extract data from the working brain. From patterns of neurons activating to points scattered in high dimensional space. Then we'll talk about shapes in these high dimensional spaces and discuss what important characteristics they might have. Finally, we'll bring everything together. Mathematically describing the clouds of points we obtain from the active brain and using the discovery that was published two years ago in Nature as an example, we'll see what insights could be generated about the data representation inside the neural circuit and how it can help us on a path to understanding our own brains. If you're ready, buckle up! The brain is made up of billions of neurons, which are electrically excitable cells. That means a neuron can generate an electrical impulse in response to the incoming stimulus. The impulse then spreads along the neuron and gets transmitted onto other neurons. When this happens, we say that a neuron has generated an action potential, or a spike. Spikes are fundamental units of communication in the brain. All the information it receives, be it a beautiful sunset, the smell of freshly baked croissants, or the notion of Pythagorean theorem you learned back in primary school, are all thought to be encoded in the collective behavior, the dynamics of a particular population of neurons. Which exactly neurons are firing? in what temporal relationship with each other these spikes occur and with what frequency, what's known as the firing rate, all determines the content of information encoded in this seemingly chaotic activity. But how exactly is information represented inside the neural circuit? What, what, what variables does the brain use and how they relate to the external world? To begin answering questions like these, we first need to somehow parameterize the activity of the circuit. For decades, scientists were able to eavesdrop on a single neuron by sticking a very thin electrode inside and measuring how the neuron's voltage varies with time and detecting when it spikes. But with that technique, we are able to record only from a handful of neurons at a time, which is not enough if we want to unravel the secrets of their collective dynamics. Only with the recent advent of multi-electrode arrays we can now get information about up to a few hundred neurons in a single recording session. Knowing when each neuron produces a spike, we obtain what's known as the spike tree. Each vertical bar here represents the firing of the corresponding neuron, so we can read out the activity of the entire network. We want to calculate the firing rate, that is, the number of spikes per unit time. To do so, we partition the time into short bins of fixed length, and for each bin, we count how many times has a neuron spiked during that time frame. As a technical note, we usually smooth the data to get a nice continuous variation instead of discrete jumps. Thus, if we have n neurons in our recording, then at each point in time, the activity of this population is characterized by n numbers, each one representing the instantaneous firing rate of the corresponding neuron. Those n numbers form an n-dimensional vector, which corresponds to a point in n-dimensional space. As the time passes and the animal is foraging or performing some other task, the pattern of activity changes. Some neurons increase their firing rates, while others fire more sparsely. Therefore, with time, this point, characterizing the instantaneous activity of the network, will move to a new position in this empirical neural activity space tracing some trajectory. The question is, are all of these points achievable? Of course, since this is a biological system, there are some physiological constraints. For example, no neuron can fire with arbitrarily large frequency. The rate of more than 500 spikes per second is impossible, 
due to the properties of the cell membrane. But other than that, could the trajectory pass through any point in this high dimensional space? Neurons we record with multi electrode arrays are part of the same network. They are intertwined and directly influence each other. So their firing rates cannot be independent and the trajectory will be confined to only a subspace of this n-dimensional activity space. How this subspace looks like, as well as the exact trajectory, would of course depend on the connectivity of the network, the strengths of the connections between the neurons and the task itself. It has been first hypothesized and then shown many times experimentally that although the ambient space is very high dimensional, the actual trajectory is confined to a very low dimensional structure. The main assumption is that certain properties of this shape that the trajectory is confined to can give us insights into the mechanisms behind this particular circuit and the nature of variables being encoded there. But before we see exactly what this means and how it could be done, let's talk about the shapes in these high dimensional spaces and discuss what properties will be important to us later on. For further investigation, we turn our attention to a very beautiful piece of mathematics, algebraic topology. It is often referred to as the geometry on a rubber sheet, where you are free to twist, bend and stretch things. That's why to a topologist, a circle and a square is practically the same thing, because one can be smoothly or continuously deformed into another. In this case, we say that they are homeomorphic. You might ask a very reasonable question. What's the point of such piece of math then? Wouldn't we be saying that all the shapes in the world are equivalent to this flexible piece of clay which we can deform into pretty much anything? Deformation in topology have their limits. We can't punch holes, tear things apart and glue them together. That's why a sphere is not homeomorphic to a torus. Turning one into another requires poking a hole or stitching parts together. But we are getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, so let's back up. The central object will be the notion of a topological space. If that sounds complicated, don't panic. I'm sure you are more familiar with them than you might think. In fact, you even live within one. Our universe is what's known as R3, the three-dimensional Euclidean space. Euclidean just refers to the way we measure distances. R3 means that your position is uniquely characterized by three real numbers. You can infinitely go in any direction and nothing interesting will happen. The sister space R2 is an infinite plane where your position is given by two numbers, x and y. Likewise, the space R is the one you are familiar with. It's just a real number line. But what about R4, R5 and even Rn? Well, since we are three-dimensional creatures, we can't directly visualize higher dimensional spaces. But mathematically, it's directly analogous. It's just a space where your position is given by 4 or 5 or n real numbers, like a fourth axis sticking out somewhere beyond our world. You may have noticed that the unconstrained version of neural activity space we obtained back in part 1 is actually an example of Rn, where n is the number of neurons we record. But if that was the whole story about topological spaces, things wouldn't be really interesting. Let's see what other topological spaces exist, other than the obvious family of Rn's. One very intuitive example is the surface of the sphere, which the surface of the Earth we live on can be approximated with. Notice that if you live on the surface of the sphere, and you keep moving forward in any direction, eventually you will reach the point where you started which is not the case in R2 at all. Other examples include distorted spheres, planes, tori, mobius strips, and even some more strangely looking things. All of these are what we're going to call manifolds. The technical definition of a manifold is a bit more abstract, but for our purposes and to develop an intuitive understanding, it's really useful to think of a manifold as some shape in an Euclidean space which locally resembles an Euclidean space of a lower dimension. Let's try to see what it means. Technically, we live on the surface of the sphere, right? a shape in three dimensions. But in our day-to-day -day lives, a surface of the Earth feels an awful lot like a flat plane. 
That's because we are very tiny compared to the Earth itself. Indeed, if you zoom in close enough, it will be indistinguishable from the plane. You may remember from calculus how if a function is smooth or differentiable at a point, around that point it could be approximated with a straight line. And it, it's the same idea. In fact, the graph of a function can be thought of as a manifold living on the plane in R2, which locally resembles a straight line, or just R. Likewise, a torus is also a manifold, because it everywhere looks like a flat plane as well. And just to give you one counterexample, if we pinch the torus, collapsing one of the circles in its cross-section into a single point, it would no longer be a manifold. Do you see why? Because around that very point where we pinched it, it no longer looks like a flat plane. No matter how close you zoom in, things are kind of funky here. Manifolds often arise when we solve differential equations or, as we'll see, analyze experimental data. Consequently, we need some meaningful ways to parameterize the resulting manifolds and to analyze their properties. If we continuously deform a sphere in some funny way, we'll still get a manifold that is topologically equivalent or homeomorphic to the sphere. And sure, it's lost all its roundness and outside symmetry, but there are some properties that stay constant or invariant under such continuous deformations. I would like to make an emphasis on two of such invariant properties of manifolds that will be important later on. That is the dimension and the genus. Let's start with the first one. We have all heard the word dimension, so we are quite familiar with it. If I ask you, what's the dimension of this manifold? What would you say? Well, it's sitting inside the three-dimensional space. We can clearly see the three axes, right? But at the same time, it's some sort of a convoluted line, which we know is one-dimensional. What's the catch here? Manifold is characterized by intrinsic and embedding dimensions. An embedding dimension is the dimension of the surrounding Euclidean space that the manifold is sitting inside of. For our squiggly line here, the embedding dimension is 3, or if it were drawn on a plane, the embedding dimension would be 2. Intrinsic dimension, however, refers to the manifold itself. It can be thought of as the number of degrees of freedom, or the number of continuous variables you would need to specify your location if you lived on this manifold. For example, the sphere is embedded in three-dimensional space, but it is intrinsically two-dimensional, because you only need two variables, latitude and longitude, to uniquely determine your position. Similarly, if you lived in a torus, or a surface of a donut, you would still need two variables, one for the angle along the big circle, and one for the other angle along the smaller circle. For our line here, we can associate each point with a color of a different hue, then, position along the line is uniquely given by hue value, or the angle along the color wheel. This is what I meant by saying the trajectory will be confined to a lower dimensional structure. Even though the ambient neural activity space is very high dimensional, the neural manifold, where the activity of the network lives at every point in time, is intrinsically of a much lower dimension. Before we move forward, Let's see why characterizing the dimension of such a manifold could be useful. You can think of a particular neural circuit as part of a computer program, executing a code snippet. It receives inputs, carries out computations, and produces an output, which then either propagates further into the brain or gets executed in the form of motor commands, for example. To perform computations relevant to behavior, the brain would need some way to encode parameters about the external world. Declare variables, if you will, about animals, position, velocity, head direction, the intensity and irritation of the incoming stimulus. Of course, we don't know exactly how this happens and what's being encoded, but we can infer the number of independent variables being used. Suppose we record population activity from part of the cortex which is responsible for movement, and we discover that the activity of the network is confined to a two-dimensional manifold. We can postulate that this circuit cannot encode two positional variables, x and y, and two velocity parameters in an independent way, because then the dynamics would need to be at least four-dimensional. Dimension is nice, but 
it would be cool to have some other information about the resultant manifold, which would relate to external variables in some meaningful way. When people talk about topology, they are required by the sacred oath to give an example of cups and donuts, and how they are the same thing, since one can be deformed into another. Look, they say, they both have a hole. What had always puzzled me is why people are so obsessed about, well, holes. Oh, yes, mathematically speaking, deformations that preserve the number of holes are by definition continuous, and continuity is kind of a big deal in math because it opens up a lot of possibilities. But that explanation isn't very enlightening either. I would like to show you how holes reflect something so fundamental and so intrinsic about the manifold itself that it's actually kind of creepy. Imagine you lived on a torus. Just like the sphere, locally it looks like a flat plane everywhere. And in the same way as with the sphere, if you walk forward in any direction, you would eventually end up in the point where you started. Is it possible for you to distinguish whether you live on a torus or on a sphere without flying into space and taking a picture? Pause and ponder about that for a minute. I'll give you a hint. You have an infinitely long, perfectly slippery string. Here's the thing. If you take this string and ask your friend to hold one end, then you go around the world reaching your starting point, but the string has now been wrapped around the planet. You take one end from your friend, while another one is in your hands, and you try to tie a knot. Let's see what happens in the case of a sphere. Since the string is slippery, the loop can easily slide along the surface, and eventually you'll end up with a free string with a knot on it. If you lived on a torus, however, and you happen to go through the hole, then no matter how hard you pull, you won't be able to tie a knot. Do you see why? Because the string can't slide along the surface, but it can't go through. It will be wrapped around the torus forever. Once you go through the hole, there is no way out other than to cut the string. Notice, we were able to distinguish between two non-homeomorphic manifolds without leaving their surfaces. In fact, we couldn't see the exact shape. It could have been a sphere or some sort of distorted finger magic. It would have the same local properties. From the point of view of someone who lives on the surface, this is indistinguishable from that. We could, however, determine whether it has a hole in it. But what is a hole anyway? It turns out holes have different dimensions as well. The intuition for one dimensional hole is like a handle. If you can't put your manifold on a necklace, it has a one dimensional hole. Two dimensional hole is something we would think of as a cavity. Take the sphere, for example. It has no one dimensional holes, but it has empty space inside which we can fill. If you can fill it up with toothpaste, it has a two dimensional hole. Unfortunately, this is where the intuitive analogy ends. But there is a mathematical definition which generalizes the notion of a hole to n dimensions. I won't go into that in this video, just mention that it uses the same trick of continuously shrinking things down into a point, like we did with the toroidal planet example. The hole is something that prevents such a shrinkage. By now you have probably guessed that we'll be interested in the number of holes the neural manifold has. So without further ado, let's see a real-life example. The brain has a dedicated system to keep track of the head orientation, which consists of special head direction cells. They seem to be representing the angle where, relative to the environment you are facing, and play a vital role in spatial navigation. These neurons have a preferred direction and signal you whether you're facing this direction or not by increasing the firing rate. Head direction system is a well-studied circuit, but it provides a very promising ground to apply the methods of analyzing the collective dynamics of a large number of neurons to uncover the true nature of latent variables being encoded. Remember our assumptions. The information representation unfolds at the scale of the population of neurons. So only by examining the activity of a large number of cells simultaneously, we can uncover something useful. If the collective dynamics of the circuit encodes a variable of a certain dimension and certain topology, then the activity of this network would be localized to a subspace or 
a manifold of the matching dimension and topology. And so we record activity from part of the thalamus where head direction cells are located. As time goes on, we make measurements about firing of neurons, obtaining a cloud of points in high dimensional space. Then we reconstruct the shape of this point cloud, how exactly they align in space. Under the hypothesis that the neurons we are studying represent the head direction, what would you expect the resulting manifold to look like? Well, if the circuit truly encodes only the direction the animal's facing, we would, we would first of all expect the manifold to be one-dimensional, because it's one variable. We'd also expect to see a hole in the middle, because the variable is measuring the angle. So, basically, something like a loop which is homeomorphic to a circle. And this is exactly what we find. The activity of a real group of neurons inside a real mouse just running around is localized to a one-dimensional ring, though granted quite a convoluted one. And the state of the network described by the point on this ring at every instance of time directly corresponds to the animal's head direction. That is, just by looking at the experimental data we record from the brain and not seeing the mouse at all, we can definitely say which direction it is facing. Isn't that fascinating? Interestingly, equal distances along the ring correspond to equal differences in the facing angle. So there is a beautiful one-to-one -one mapping between the two. To me, this is just a brilliant example of how intrinsic dimension and topology of the neural activity manifold inform us about the structure of data being encoded inside the circuit. Topological data analysis and computational neuroscience are both very young fields, and they are only beginning to intertwine with each other. But this interaction is very, very promising on our quest to understand how information is embedded into high-dimensional representations, allowing the brain to perform complex tasks. By analyzing the geometry of neural population activity, we can gain insights into the internal workings of various brain regions. For example, how the structure called hippocampus encodes your position in space, how motor cortex prepares and executes movement, and even how the brain creates abstractions and generalizations. A and all of that is just the very beginning of this exciting journey ahead of us. So hopefully, next time you plan to impress girls by talking about topology, you won't be limited to coffee mugs and donuts.